Καλημέρα σε όλες και σε όλους. Thank you very much, uh, the Chief of the Air Force and the Air Force staff for this invitation that honors me to come to my country and present to this uh, audience uh, about the latest developments in artificial intelligence with particular application in aerospace and defense. Um, at the start of the talk, I would like to thank the US Air Force for the continued support they have given me over a number of years to support my research in aero defense applications. I would like to start by saying that uh, the aim of my talk within the next uh, 15 minutes is just to uh, give you an idea about the state of the art work in the area of AI for defense, but also to um, touch on some issues that have to do with the overestimation and the hype that exists about AI, and also to touch on the underestimation of the associated risks and challenges that we have with artificial intelligence. So the time is very short, so I will jump into the presentation. Many of you may be aware about artificial intelligence, what artificial intelligence uh, does as a principle, but I just want to summarize and say that artificial intelligence is a field that exists for many, for many years. It started in uh, the 60s, continued to develop in the 70s. We gave, at that uh, time, different names in the academic institutions, we called optimization methods, neural networks, and in the last uh, 10 years has emerged with the term uh, more prominently as artificial intelligence and machine learning. So essentially, if we want to use layman's language, what artificial intelligence is, we try to mimic how the brain works and we try to establish computationally a system of artificial neural networks that will mimic the human intelligence. There are a number of methods, the number of techniques, within this field. There are too many, I would say, and, and still develop. Every academic, every researcher want to develop their own methods. And there are some big institutions which are not related to aerospace and defense that have pioneered the development of these methods, like Google and Facebook and other companies, because these companies uh, get data, parse data from the Internet of Things. Now, the definition is quite diverse, and there are a number of things which are related to um, regulatory skills, technology, and risks issues that we need to bear in mind when we talk about artificial intelligence. Also, we need to bear in mind, as uh, I will speak later on, um, about the big challenge of developing software for artificial intelligence, because the artificial intelligence comprises three main things. One is the data, the other is the computing power, and then is the validation, the theory, which is the weakest link uh, right now in the field of AI. Now, if we look at the current market trends, uh, we will see that, and it's not quite surprising actually, that the artificial intelligence has a lot of interest in the field of aerospace and defense. The reason is that there is a change in the warfare, and we will see more of it actually in the future, which raises also some ethical concerns. For example, we see the drones, the development of swarm of drones, and I will show you some examples from our own research in the field of swarm of drones. We see bio-inspired robots and robots in general, which require this kind of communication and development of um, intelligence and, and, and learning from the environment in order to function and operate more efficiently. Now, of course, these developments are funded extensively by some governments. So we have also NATO that has put uh, one billion US dollars into the field. We have the DOD budget, which is about 874 million on AI. And, and this will continue to increase because we believe that the more data we collect and the more developments in this field will give us a more superiority actually across land, sea, and air applications. Now, this trend actually of developing these artificial intelligence methods is not only in the US and the Western world. There is a lot of development in China. I would say that China is probably one of the areas that pioneers in, in the APAC region, the Asian Pacific region. And, and we will see more development um, from China in the field of AI. Of course, they have institutions and many researchers who are working in the field. They have many Chinese who are in the United States and return to the China. So we will see more and more coming from, from this region in, in the field of the AI. So this competition thrives the development of AI and the investment into the artificial intelligence. Now, one of the interesting things to observe is if we look at the market segments in aerospace, in particular, which is my field of expertise, 
uh, you will see that most of the investment is into software. And this is not surprising for someone who has developed codes for years. This is justified by the complexity of the algorithms and the associated software that is required to develop uh, the codes that we need in order to support artificial intelligence. So we'll see increasingly to put more money into software, and this gives a competitive advantage uh, to countries like Greece that has a lot of personnel, a lot of brains here that we can use actually to develop software in-house in the country and not rely to black boxes that we may need to purchase from a, a third party. Now, I mentioned that software is, is a big challenge, artificial intelligence, and one of the reasons it's a big challenge is that as the artificial intelligence becomes, and the machine learning algorithms become more and more complex, this software becomes bigger and bigger. So there is a point, actually, that this software will be very difficult to be controlled. For many years, there is research into how we can, in general, control software, and we can have access to it. But this is something that is very difficult, because the software is developed by different people in different locations. There is legacy software that has developed 10, 20 years ago. Some people will retire at some point, and this software cannot be easily documented. So one of the biggest threats and risks in artificial intelligence is, first, that we will not be able to control the software because it has been developed by different parties. And second, that uh, part of the software may be black box that is provided by another party and we will not have access to it, but this black part may have actually very significant information that we need to be aware of, otherwise we will not be able actually to control. The third issue is the bias, that the, the user can put also information into the software, and, and uh, this information may have some characteristics that we call bias that may um, lean onto a particular direction, which may or may not be the favorable direction for a, another party. So there are quite a few challenges in relation to software and the algorithms associated, actually, with the development of this software. Just to show you um, just a snapshot from the complexity of artificial intelligence, what you see on the left, you see a, a set of neural networks, which are essentially these neurons that we try to mimic the, the brain behavior, the artificial intelligence that we try to uh, replicate uh, from the human brain. And we see a number of different architectures. Now, one of the things I have to point out is that there is no exact theory how these uh, um, systems, uh, to use simple language, of neurons work. There is no mathematical theory. There is not a proven theory. This, this is another uncertainty about artificial intelligence. What we rely on when we develop these this algorithms and methods, we rely essentially on data. And uh, companies like Google, of course, have access to a huge number of data because of the Internet of Things. But this is not necessarily the case when you have uh, uh, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy. The data may be uh, quite um, scattered and may be also diverse and may be uh, very reduced data. Um, in other words, maybe data that are not conventional data for uh, machine learning and artificial uh, intelligence algorithms. So we rely, uh, nevertheless, on data. Then we have the computing, which is very important, the computing power. Unless you have huge, massive computing power to support the analysis, especially if you want to perform this analysis on the fly, then artificial intelligence is of no use. Um, so the algorithms work because you have the computing power and the data. And the third thing, which is, in my opinion, the weakest link, is, is the theory. We, we are lacking theory about these methods. The methods work in many cases, but still, in many cases, we don't know how these methods work. So there is significant research that needs to be carried out in order to understand better these algorithms before we put them actually in, in use in the battlefield uh, or, or in other applications. Now, the applications, of course, are diverse and can be uh, very fulfilling uh, to materialize the development of these methods. Uh, we have applications that can be in Navy, can be in the Army, can be in the Air Force. Uh, but in my personal opinion, a lot of uh, work, uh, a lot of benefits from the work in AI can come from the application of AI in, in engineering and design. And this is something, actually, which is under development in the manufacturing industry that we put a lot of effort actually to develop algorithms in order to improve products, including, uh, of course, defense products, and, and, and provide better designs which will be more optimized than using conventional techniques. Now, um, as part of my research, uh, I, I do work in uh, high-speed um, aerospace applications, uh, in particular uh, aerodynamics, acoustics, and aeroelasticity. 
And this is a field where um, machine learning and artificial intelligence has found very little application so far. And one particular reason is what I mentioned uh, earlier about data. The data in this field is very difficult to collect. We can't have enough sensors on an aircraft in order to collect data, and we don't have enough information of the wind tunnels. Every wind tunnel experiment costs uh, hundreds of thousands of euros or US dollars. So one big opportunity for artificial intelligence is to develop algorithms that will be based on reduced data. Uh, and this is the work we uh, currently do in my group, uh, where we can combine information, uh, scatter information from experiments, simulations, and, and, and field data. And we can put them all together in order to develop reduced models in, in the framework of artificial intelligence. So there's a huge opportunity there, especially in the high-speed flows regime, maybe application in aircraft, maybe in missiles or, or other, other applications that artificial intelligence can be used in order to optimize the processes. Another area, and again, this is an example from research from my own group, um, that artificial intelligence can find a, a great deal of application is uh, the autonomous vehicles, in particular drones and swarm of drones. Now, as we develop uh, more efficient drones, and we have the ability now to combine the flight of different drones, which may be UCAVs, maybe UAVs for surveillance, maybe kamikaze drones, any kind of uh, such uh, uh, systems, we need increasingly to optimize the flight of these systems and the communication between the systems. And when we refer to um, optimizing the systems, we refer not only to uh, optimizing the communication during the flight, but also the design of the systems and the formation of flight in order to achieve the best aerodynamic performance and the uh, reduced footprint we want in terms of the acoustics and, and thermal footprint. Now, I show you here an example of um, uh, six drones and diff uh, two different formation flights where we have used machine learning in conjunction with computational aerodynamics and acoustics in order to do three things. Uh, first, to reduce the drag around this formation. Second, to reduce the acoustic footprint. And third, to enable better communication between these drones. And as a specific example of the acoustic footprint, uh, we see here from um, the bio-inspiring formation of birds, which have a V-shape, that we have used two different uh, uh, flight formations, one H-type and one uh, V-shape. And we see how the V-shape flight actually, uh, in conjunction with machine learning, can reduce the acoustic footprint for a specific range of frequencies. So this is an area where uh, artificial intelligence can find a lot of application. We, we use the methods just to give you some more specific idea in conjunction with the computational and numerical simulation. So we perform the simulations, and during the simulations, we apply artificial intelligence in order to optimize the process and see how we can reduce the acoustic footprint. This could be part of an operation of an aircraft, potentially, or this could be part of uh, the design process uh, when we want to decide what's the best formation or the best design for a drone or a formation of drones. Another area where um, we believe that artificial intelligence can find a great deal of application is um, the area of integrated operational scenarios. Now, this is an area that is very promising because you can combine information and input of data um, from different sources. But one big challenge here is the computation power because you want to analyze uh, the data, uh, real-time data, in a very short turnaround time. And this should be a few seconds, minutes. And of course, you need enormous computing power to do that. The second biggest challenge here is that you have data which are not huge data, are not massive data. So deep learning, which is the, the classical approach in machine learning and AI, requires massive data. So the question is how we can use with a reduced number of data that come on the fly and, and produce information through AI that can be very useful uh, to the operation theater, can give feedback to the ground, and we will enable us to deploy forces better or uh, execute uh, the power and deliver the power we want on time and to specification. So that's something that needs a lot of computation support 
enter algorithms, new algorithms, that will be able actually to provide the support computationally, but using this reduced data. So there's a lot of research that still needs to be done before we um, actually take techniques like AI and implement them in, 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 this, in this domain. But of course, it is something that is doable, and I believe that it will happen in the future. Now, by increasing the complexity of algorithms and increasing the, um, the computational uh, techniques in terms of software lines and in terms of uh, uh, complex uh, algorithmic uh, items, we also increase the uncertainty. And, and this is something that we have to bear in mind. Uh, I'm always a believer of simplicity, and I believe simplicity is a virtue, and sometimes over rely on complexity where the solutions can be very simple. So I just want to mention a few actual issues that can arise with AI. Uh, first of all, we have to bear in mind that AI has a stochastic element, so it's not an exact mathematical theory, it's not physics, it's not based on the second Newton law. Uh, it's based on some um, interpolation uh, approaches uh, that we don't know even we, scientists, that we do research in this field, how exactly they work. And we are talking now for uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands of neurons that we involve into this process, which uh, operate somehow autonomously. So th this is a big uncertainty. We need to do more work to understand these methods. The second is the general question whether or not we are happy to rely on estimates. Of course, you may say that uh, every chief, every commander, will take a decision based on some uh, estimates and some calculated uh, risks. AI will do the same thing. The, the thing which is very important is not to replace the commander, not to replace the human, because the human has also some moral values and has some big, bigger understanding which has to do with the, their own consciousness when they take decisions, and, and, and this is a very complex, uh, complex area, and not only based on uh, simple mathematical and numerical uh, data. Um, now, the question is, can the AI uh, forecast be more accurate than human? The, the question is, we have to define what we call by forecast. Is forecast simply a decision that is based on data, or the decision should be based on other issues that go beyond data? And, and this is a very important thing. So in my opinion, human cannot be replaced in the loop from the AI, and will be strategically and tactically incorrect to do that. So how can we create explainable AI for the non-expert? This is a big risk, because the majority of people who will use AI will not know what AI is. We will see AI to be used in banks, in medicine, uh, in the defense in the future, and, and we have to be very, very careful to understand the risks and the uncertainty. So when you get an answer from the machine learning algorithm, you should be able to assess whether this answer makes sense or not. We should not become part of the machine system, but we should have the upper hand on the machine system. So this is why it's very important actually to create AI with explainable information for those who are not, who are uninitiated uh, users, who are not the experts. And finally, uh, last but not least, is the moral implications. So what gives us the moral ground to send a UAV or a UCAV to a place and uh, rely on the machine to take the decision when uh, an attack will be executed? This is a big moral question because it's different to have boots on the ground that see and they have the sense of what is going on there. It is different to be away from this uh, exact uh, spot and the decision to be taken by a system that may or may not have some bias but certainly will not be perfect. So there are big moral issues actually that need to be borne in mind before we implement remotely, especially in the field of UCAV or, or other systems, uh, AI in the future. I don't believe we are very close to do that, but certainly this will come at some point in the future unless we, we put some regulations and controls and moral controls around this. Now, because this uncertainty increases, we have also to bear in mind that um, validation is the ultimate goal of any method and algorithm and software we develop. So in, in engineering, aerospace, mechanical engineering, we develop uh, methods, techniques, we simulate processes, and then we have experiments uh, which are taken in the lab or they're taken in flight experiments, and we compare our computational data, the digital information, against experimental information. So the, this is 
the ultimate goal of the scientific development, to ensure that everything we develop is properly validated and, and analyzed. Now, with AI, we are not in a position to do that in most of the cases. So we receive hundreds, billions, hundreds of thousands, billions of, of, uh, of thousands of data, and these data actually are fed into algorithms. And these algorithms are supposed to tell us the absolute truth. But in many cases, we don't have the ability, actually, to validate this answer. So it's very, very important to develop techniques, AI techniques, that can be validated. If we go beyond this boundary of the validation, then we increase the uncertainty significantly. And if this uncertainty increases to the point that cannot be controlled, this is what we call that AI then can be very, very dangerous because we will not know what we are doing. Now, another aspect that is more specific, not to the operations, but to the engineering, is how we can introduce physics-informed machine learning into the optimization processes. So instead of getting data, develop algorithms, and the algorithms will give us an answer, to introduce physics as part of the algorithm's development. So when we want, for example, to apply AI in aerodynamics or aeroacoustics or uh, uh, thermal engineering, then the, the fundamental knowledge about these fields to be part of the development of the AI algorithms. And this is an area that my group and I, with our international collaborators, are working uh, intensively to develop methods which are physics informed. Now, in conclusion, um, I would like to say that there is huge potential in uh, the development and application of uh, machine learning. Um, despite that, there are significant risks. Uh, there are uh, significant opportunities, especially in Greece. We have, uh, as I said uh, earlier, um, a, a pool of brains that we can um, uh, use and we can draw resources from there and we can use it in software development. Uh, it is not a difficult task for any country, even a small country, to develop AI in terms of algorithms because AI is about algorithms and software. So there is a great opportunity for Greece to do that. Uh, there is a big risk uh, when we uh, import uh, software about machine learning and AI, and this will become bigger and bigger in the future, because if the software is not open source and this black box, it will be very difficult to be controlled. And especially in defense applications, you want to have the control of what you're doing. You don't want to get an answer, will not be able to evaluate, but then you will be obliged to apply because this method, this software was given to you. So I think this is crucial in every aspect of defense we are going in the future to apply artificial intelligence. And, and finally, I would like to say that there are a great deal of uncertainties about AI, that despite the fact that we do a lot of development, uh, there is a lot of computational power that we need to uh, support uh, in order to create this infrastructure to support development of AI. And we have to bear in mind that this is an additional cost uh, for uh, every Air Force, for every army, for every country, if they want to become uh, leaders uh, or even to become expert users in the application of AI in their field. Thank you very much indeed.